Okay, um, let's get started, everyone. So, today I want to talk about uh, uh, calibration of classifiers and uh, dealing with imbalanced data and some ways we can um, maybe change the model building process if we have imbalanced data. Some quick logistics. So you hopefully have seen that homework three is out. So um, different from homework one and two, homework three you can do in pairs of two. So please try to find a partner. Um, you can do it uh, by yourself if you want, but it's probably much easier if you do it with someone else. The homework will be due after spring break. And so before spring break, obviously we'll have our midterm. And so in the next couple of days, I will publish a practice midterm that you can use to study and that will hopefully give you some idea of what kind of questions I'll ask. So the format of the practice midterm will be exactly the same as of the midterm. The questions will just be slightly different and so hopefully that'll give you um, some idea of what to study. All right, so calibration very much um, built upon what we talked about uh, last week in terms of model evaluation. In that calibration cares, um, or whether models calibrated is one way to evaluate a model. The goal of calibration is, excuse me, to make um, probabilistic prediction statements. And so in many cases, uh, having the actual probabilities can be an informative uh, source uh, for downstream use. So if you want to communicate to a user, um, like a diagnosis or like to a patient saying, um, the model predicted uh, you don't have cancer is very different from the model predicted you're 40% likely to have cancer. Um, if you threshold by the default 50%, uh, these two statements will be the same, but probably if you tell someone um, you're 40% likely to have cancer, they will probably be very, react very differently to telling them they don't have cancer. And so sometimes probabilities can be useful uh, to communicate directly to your user or to some intermediate. And uh, sometimes you can use them uh, for building um, automate decision-making models. So I talked last time about assigning costs to the different parts of the confusion matrix. Basically, if you have a cost for each possible um, mistake or a benefit for each possible correct classification, um, to make this into a decision model, you actually need to have um, probabilities. And you could also try to optimize it directly, but it's basically much more easy to think about a decision-making framework if you know the probabilities of the outcomes. As we discussed last time, many of the models in scikit-learn allow you to get some estimated probabilities with predict proba. However, the predicted probabilities uh, might not really reflect um, calibrated probabilities. And so basically, uh, calibrated probabilities are those that uh, actually re reflect the, um, the likelihood of an event happening. So give me one second. Uh, I should have had a slide with a definition of calibration, but I think I'll just go um, directly to the definition of calibration curve. A calibration curve or a reliability diagram shows um, for a given classifier and given predictions, how much the um, probabilities match the actually observed outcomes. So in essence, if a classifier tells you it's 60% uh, likely that this point will be classified as class one, then for 60% of the cases where it says uh, it's 60% likely, the actual outcome should be class one, and for 40%, the actual outcome should be class zero. That's what you would expect if this classifier says it's 60% likely is that 
if you average all of the, these cases where you classify as that, in 60% it's one and 40% it's zero. And so the calibration curve is a way to visualize or to measure um, in how far this is true. So let's say we have a binary classification task and we have some estimated probability p hat of y. And so let's say, uh, maybe saying y wasn't so good. So let's say this is p hat of one. So there's a probability that um, the classifier thinks the outcome is class one. And then we have some true labels, say on our test set, um, y, which are just the binary labels zero or one. So we don't have probabilistic ground truth. We only have the uh, actual measured outcomes. That's usually what you have in practice. You only have the answers. You don't have uncertainty of the answers. You only like observe some outcomes zero or one. What a calibration curve does is then it basically aggregates uh, predictions according to uh, their estimated outcome. So here in this toy example, basically I create uh, three different bins of probabilities that were predicted. The first one is from, um, it's basically from 0.66 to one, and the other one is from 0.66 to 0.33, and then there's one from 0.33 to zero. And so I look, so these are just equidistant bins between zero and one. And now for each of the bins, um, I count if the estimated probability was in this bin, how often was Y actually one? And so here for the highest bin, um, the highest bin contains these two predictions, one that had 90% probability and one that has 0.8% probability, sorry, point, had 80% probability, and they are both actually one. So for this bin, the uh, frequency of class one will be one. In this toy example here, for the second bin, I have two points in it. One had 60% probability, and one had 40% probability, and both were actually zeros. So for this bin, the actual frequency of the class one is zero. And for the last one, I have these three data points in it, and the actual probability in this bin is one third. And so the calibration uh, curve basically now plots these. So I have these three bins. The bin center for the first bin is this, for the second bin is this, and for the third bin is this. So these are just equidistant bins. And so we would expect that for the first bin, um, the expected number of positives would be 16%. And if the, uh, this classifier was perfectly calibrated, we would expect 16% to be um, positive in this bin. For the center bin, we would expect 50% to be uh, positive. And for the last bin, we would expect 84% to be positive, even though and it was one. So this here is obviously very coarse because I just like made up seven data points. Um, but, uh, if you uh, do this on real data sets, then you can get um, actually quite uh, accurate pictures of how well you calibrate it. So here, let's do this with a real data set. Um, yeah, so I think this is the, the, oh yeah, it says the cover type data set. So the cover type data set, um, we're using just a subsample of this, but uh, it's like, um, 50,000 data points in, 40, in 54 dimensions. And um, so we train a logistic regression model. We know logistic regression can make probabilistic predictions. And now our question is, well, we trained a probabilistic, uh, sorry, a re logistic regression model on this data set. Um, the probabilities that they estimate, are these actually meaningful probabilities? And so here I, I fit my logistic regression model uh, I use logistic regression CV, which automatically um, addresses the parameter C. So here I assume the data is already scaled, um, just as a caveat. So then I have in my test, for my test set, I have the true labels and I have the probabilities predicted by the model. And so these probabilities is what I'm gonna bin. And then for each bin, I'm gonna uh, count 
how often was the uh, probability true? And so by so here I compute a calibra calibration curve with five bins. And so for the first bin, um, the uh, let me see, did I name them correctly? Yeah, so, oh, so the, the hmm, I think I named them the wrong way around. So the bottom, I think, should be the expected ones. Oh, yeah, no, this is the predicted probabilities. Um, that's interesting. Yeah, so basically, um, for the first bin, the, the mean predicted probability the way the bin is defined was 13%. Um, uh, so um, this is the bin center. And the actual count of positives in it was 20%. So we can see here, this is this point. Um, the diagonal line would say it matches exactly. The predicted uh, probabilities are exactly the observed frequencies. Um, and so you can see here, for the first bin, the um, Actually, it was, uh, in a sense, underpredicting. So it was giving um, less likelihood to the positive class than it should have. However, for the other bins, it actually matches quite well. And you can see that in this bin, the, um, the predicted probabilities, the mean of them is um, 30%, and the expected, and the actual one is also 30%, and, um, and so on. And so this tells us, basically, the more the or orange line matches the diagonal line, the better, our, uh, the better calibrated the classifier and the more the probabilities actually match um, what we expect them to mean. So if this classifier says uh, this point is 30% uh, likely to be class 1, then in 30% of cases, it will actually be class 1. In general, people find logistic regression is often pretty well calibrated. So um, that's sort of what I would expect is that uh, logistic regression um, yeah, gives me pretty good estimates. You can also actually um, compute a metric on how calibrated the classifier is. We don't have that in scikit-learn yet, so I don't have it on the slides. But basically, you can one way to compute how, how well calibrated a classifier is is to measure the distance of the points from the diagonal. And so, because they're here very closely ma matching the diagonal, this classifier would have a very good score. Um, yeah, one of the things, if you plot this, or if you compute this metric, that you need to take into account is the number of bins. So depending on how much data points you have, um, you can ha use more or less bins. So if you use very few bins, say five, then you get a very coarse measurement. If you um, use like a lot of bins, say 50, then you get a very noisy estimate because there will be very few data points in most of the bins. And so you can see, so here this, the light blue at the bottom is um, the distribution of the data points. So you can see most of the data points are actually way over here. There's very few data points over here. And so these bins here are mostly empty, and so the estimate here is pretty bad. All right. So this was for logistic regression, which, as I said, we expect to, uh, the probabilities to actually be quite meaningful. So now let's look at a couple of other models. Um, so on the left-hand side is logistic regression. In the center is the decision tree classifier. So here I use a decision tree that I didn't prune. And so as we discussed before, if uh, I don't prune a, a decision tree classifier, then it will um, always be certain either of class 0 or of class 1 because it uh, counts the class frequencies in the leaves. And if I don't prune the tree, all the leaves will be pure. And so, in this case, it's kind of boring in a sense because there's only two bins that have data, the bin at zero and the bin at one. And um, 
Obviously, the bin at zero, you would expect there to be zero probability for it to be class one, but the classifier is not perfect, and so there's actually um, around 20% probability for, the, for these points to be class one. And again, and for the bin of 100% uh, probability at one, the, um, again, the probability of being of class one is not one because the classifier is not perfect. And so, um, yeah, you are also off the diagonal here. So this is a very extreme case in the sense um, that you only have data on the very ends. And then uh, next is the random forest classifier. Even though I didn't do pruning because of um, the bagging that happens in the random forest classifier, you get some uncertainty estimate. Um, but you can see that there is sort of an S uh, shape. And this S shape is actually quite characteristic for building models on, um, oh, building random forest models. And so, let, let me make sure uh, I get this uh, correct. And so, you can see here that in the bin that has the mean predicted probability of say 0.2, actually fraction of positives is about zero. So the random force is actually is too uncertain. So here the, the, um, the decision tree was basically, this is the diagonal, the decision tree was like this, meaning it was too certain. The, and the random forest is like this, meaning, meaning it's too uncertain. So if the random forest tells me, oh, it's 90% likely that uh, this is class one, in reality, it will always be class one. So it, it doesn't trust the prediction enough. And this is basically what this S curve means that is sort of above and then goes be below. So um, yeah, there are several ways, as I said, to measure the calibration. One thing that um, is important to note is that calibration and accuracy are slightly orthogonal axes. Um, so you could, you could do a classifier that is perfectly classify, uh, calibrated and completely useless. If you have a, you know, let's say you have a balanced data set, so it's, um, and your classifier always predicts um, 50, a probability of 50%. For each data point, you predict a probability of 50% to be class one. Of all the points where it predicts 50% to be class one, 50% are class one because uh, let's assume the data set is balanced. So this classifier that makes a constant prediction of always the class frequency is perfectly calibrated, but it's completely useless because um, it's very inaccurate or get, gives a very bad ranking of the data points because it just assigns everything the, main, the same probability. So the, whether your ranking of the data points is correct and whether your, uh, your calibration of the probabilities are correct, they are really um, not the same thing at all. And so you can be very well calibrated and be, make, basically make useless prediction. And you can make uh, predictions that are ranked very well but are very badly calibrated. So for example, there's a random force classifier here is probably pretty good, but it's not very well calibrated. And so there's different ways to measure these two axes of the, uh, of the probabilistic outputs. One score that's actually quite um, um, commonly used is the uh, Breyer score. So the Breyer score is basically the mean squared error for probability estimates. And so it's, in a sense, you could think of it, uh, it's a little bit silly because it's the mean squared error where one of them is always zero or one. So here yi is either zero or one and p hat of yi is the, estim is the probability. Again, it should be p hat of one. Um, and so basically, 
if you assign probability zero to class zero, then um, the loss is, is zero. If you assign probability of 0.5 to something that's of class zero, you get a loss of 0.5 squared. So it's like, it's really just um, a mean squared error, but one of them is only zero or one, and the other one is between zero and one. And this kind of, this is a relatively simple way to measure this. Um, it has some nice properties, but also it mixes these two things. It mixes how accurate the model is and how well calibrated it is. So you can all only get a perfect Briar score if your model is um, perfectly calibrated and perfectly accurate. And so the way this is um, usually written down, zero is optimum because it's like a mean squared error. You can also do one minus uh, this thing. But so uh, the way it's written here, zero is optimum and one would be terrible and probably not possible. Well, one would be you always predict the exact opposite. And so here um, you can see the scores for the three classifiers we looked at. Uh, logistic regression is actually very well calibrated, but it's not very accurate on this data set. Um, the decision tree is less calibrated, but more accurate. And so actually the Briar score is better. And the random forest classifier in this case, because it's even more accurate, even though it's not very well calibrated, has a lower Briar score. So yeah, it would be nice to also actually have this, the calibration metric, which tells you basically the distance of the, of the orange curve from the diagonal. Um, yeah, there's a pull request for this. Hopefully it's gonna get merged before the next release, but um, right now I didn't, I didn't add it to the slides. All right, so this is a way how you can visualize and how you can measure it, uh, whether the probabilities that um, your model is predicting are meaningful. But now let's say um, we have this random forest classifier. It already has like a pretty good Briar score here. And so, but we see this S shape. So clearly there's something systematically going on. And so we want to make the uh, probabilities of the random forest classifier better. We want to um, fix them that so they're calibrated. And um, this might seem a little bit magical at first, but we can fix them without having probabilistic estimates. So just given um, an additional validation set that again has just binary outcomes, zero and one, we can uh, fit another model uh, that will basically um, remove this bias that we have. Very briefly, this is, um, we're building just another model. We're building a 1D regression model that basically tries to map the orange point to the diagonal. So if, um, you can think of it as like building a 1D regression that uh, tries to fix all the orange points so they lie on the diagonal. And um, so let's say, um, we want to fit, fit this F uh, calibration. There should be only one L. Um, and we want this to be approximately y, P of Y. The, yeah, as I said, the kind of tricky thing is we don't observe P of Y. We only observe the value zero and one. But it's fine, we can still fit this model. And we can also do this for models that don't have probabilistic estimates at all. So if we train a kernel SVM, a kernel SVM has no probabilistic model, but we can just use the scores that it outputs and uh, fit a model on this. So in scikit-learn, the um, SVM has a flag called probabilities that you can set to true. If you set it to true, it just fits this extra model on top. Yeah, and so um, there's basically two ways to fit this. Um, F calib, so either, so you, you shouldn't use it on the training data set because on a training data set, your probability estimates will be way off. So you could either fit it doing cross-validation or you could fit it with a separate validation set. 
And then, of course, you have to decide what should be the form of this um, fcalif. What should be my, um, this function I want to fit? There's uh, two kinds of functions that people commonly use. Uh, one is called plot scaling. Plot scaling is basically a 1D logistic regression. So here you do a logistic regression where your feature, the single feature that you use is the output of the classifier. And um, well, I think I guess there's like some some minor tricks in there, but basically you use the one feature. Um, uh, that you use the output of the classifier, and then you learn a single slope and a single offset. And so this works very well for SVMs. Um, it doesn't necessarily work well for random forests because the sigmoid only allows you to, to shape it in one direction. And so basically, if you're, if you're over certain, you can put it through the sigmoid to make it less certain, but if you're, too, if you're under certain, it's harder to reshape this curve with a sigmoid. So anyway, but uh, one thing that's nice about this is you're basically just learning two numbers. There's W and B, um, and, then, uh, and then afterwards you have calibrated probabilities. And as we usually do with logistic regression, you can, you can do this um, with the target just being zero or one. Another way is uh, isotonic regression. So isotonic regression in the sense is like way on the other end in that it's, um, it's a non-parametric estimate so it can map model arbitrarily complex functions basically. Isotonic regression is defined as the monotonic function in 1D that fits the data best. And so you can actually optimize this in like a relatively straightforward way. You can fi um, so you can fit any function that can be um, like arbitrarily complicated, but you can require it to be monotonous. And with this requirement, you can basically define it uh, uniquely. And so uh, here is um, what a fit like this might look like. So um, let's say you have um, the data are the red dot dots. So here on the x-axis is one feature, and on the y-axis is your target, and then the uh, green dots would be your isotonic fit. So what you get from an isotonic regression is basically a step function. Um, depending exactly on the definition, in some areas where there's no data, there might be like a linear interpolation or it might just be a step function. And so isotonic regression, the way it's implemented in scikit-learn only works on 1D data. There are some ways to extend it to end up to have multiple features, but it's like, yeah, I mean, there's several ways to define that. But basically, usually you define this on a single feature, which is exactly the case where we have, again, the single feature is the output of our original classifier. Um, there's one way in which this picture is a little bit misleading. And uh, I have a better picture in two slides. But this picture is misleading in that uh, for our setting of calibration, the y will either be 0 or 1. So we're not going to have like red points going around. They will either be at the very top or at the very bottom. And we try to snake something through there. Because the, again, the probabilities that we observe are only 0 or 1. All right, yeah. Um, and I, said, I think I just said that already. So you can't really use the train data to build the model because um, let's say if you're using a decision tree, we know on the training data the probabilities will be correct. 
but they will be super overfitted. Um, so you can either use a holdout set or you can use cross-validation. Um, so one way you could do is use cross-validation to make unbiased um, probability predictions for each sample in the training set and then use the whole training set. This is actually not what scikit-learn says, so maybe I should change that. Um, what scikit-learn does is um, for each, like let's say you do k-fold cross-validation, for each split of the data, um, you fit your model, you do make predictions on the validation part, then you fit the uh, calibration model on the validation part, and you store both the model and the calibration model. If you don't want to make predictions on a new data set, you take all of the models you learned during cross-validation. So let's say you did five-fold cross-validation. You have five original models and five calibration models on top. And you make predictions which each of these five models and average them. Because all of them have um, now calibrated probabilities, it makes sense to average them. And the outcome will again be a calibrated probability. So this is um, basically doing calibration and then an ensemble over the cross-validation folds, um, which is maybe not like the, the most obvious way to do it, but um, it's definitely a very robust way. All right. So I'm going to illustrate this, though, with the case of just having a validation data set because it's a little bit easier. So. As I said, the, the other picture was a little bit misleading because this is our, actually our data set. So this is on the um, on this like 50,000 samples um, of the cover type data set. <laughs> on like the separate validation set, we have on the y-axis the label, which is either zero or one. And on the x-axis, we have the output of our um, random forest predicted probabilities. So this is the training set, and now we can try to fit either a logistic sigmoid to it, or we can try to fit uh, isotonic regression. And um, that's what the fit would look like. So as you can see, it doesn't really go through any of the data points. Um, only at like a top and at a bottom. But that's, um, yeah, that's sort of how it has to be because um, we don't have any probabilistic estimates. And basically, you're trying to interpolate the probabilistic estimates between 0 and 1. So here's how you can do this with uh, scikit-learn. So there's the calibrated classifier CV. This is the version that does cross-validation internally. So I do a train test split. I, oh, wait. Oh yeah, so you can do it either with cross-validation or not. So actually, I'm doing it without cross-validation uh, first. So I do a train test split, and then I also have uh, Y train sub and Y vol. So I have a, a, a small training set and a validation set. I train my random force classifier on a subset. I get out the probabilities and I plot them. This was the S curve we said earlier. This is the original probabilities that the random force gives us. Now essentially this calibrated classifier CV with my random forest. Um, because I don't want to do cross validation, I said CV equal to prefit which tells it, I already fit this model, and I'm going to give you the validation data. If I set CV equal to 5, it would do internal 5-fold cross-validation. With CV equal to prefit, it's just going to fit the calibration model on the validation data I give it, and assumes the random forest was already fit pre-4. And I do this once with the method sigmoid, and once with the method isotonic. And so now you can see the calibration curve for um, the original, the sigmoid calibration, and the isotonic calibration. And um, 
Again, we have the Briar score. You can see the Briar score got a little bit better. It's the same for both of them. Um, but you can see that the, the scores are much closer to diagonal. So if, you have a, if, you, if we had a score that looked only at how calibrated it is, now it's much more calibrated than it was before. And so now basically, if it says it's 80% likely that this point belongs to uh, class one, then it actually is 80% likely that the point uh, belongs to class one. Or rather, I should say, for 80% of the points where it says it's 80% likely that it belongs to class one, they will actually belong to class one. And so basically what, the, what this 1D regression did for us is it made this curve uh, be closer to the diagonal. So if we want to do the cross-validation, cross-validated version, then um, by default, I think CV is equal to five. And so I just give it a random forest. And so we'll retrain the random forest classifier for five different splits. As I said, it will do uh, calibration on the validation part each time. And so, and then I'm plotting the calibration curve on the test set. Oh yeah, so there's also, for this previous plot, this is the plot on the test set. If I use the validation set to do the calibration, I don't want to plot it on the validation set. Obviously, it's going to be perfect on the validation set. I want to plot it on the test set. And so here, I plot it on the test set. And so, yeah, I don't know if you can see but much of a difference between the using a single um, split and using a cross-validation. The, the predicted probabilities here seem to be a little bit more smooth in, the, in this one than in this one. But like, if you look at the histograms, but it didn't seem to make big, much of a difference. The score is a little bit better also. All right. So this was for 1D. You can do um, the same thing for multi-class classification. I think this is less commonly used. So for binary classification, this is like, uh, like quite a common approach. For multi-class, I've seen this less commonly used. Um, basically, if you look at multi-class classification, what you're doing is you're learning a vector field on a simplex, which is slightly harder to visualize than a 1D regression. Um, and so, This here is the probability simplex if you have three classes. So if you have three classes, the three probabilities of the classes are have to sum to one. And so um, here this is plotted in the, in the projection on probability of class uh, one and two. And basically the probability of class three would be one minus the sum of these two. And so here there's sort of the, the center point, which means which corresponds to all the classes having the same probability, and the corners correspond to probability of one for one of the classes. And so, um, this is like a small data set, a uh, small synthetic data set, and so here, basically, we did, um, I think we trained a random forest classifier or, uh, and then we um, did a sigmoid calibration and basically each of the errors here shows the function that was learned for uh, each of the points. So there was a point that uh, before was predicted as having the probabilities that correspond to this point and the isotonic regression moved it here. Oh, so actually, I don't think this is a random forest because it actually moves the stuff away from the corners. So you can see that points here are all moved towards there, which basically means that um, the things that were very uh, certain, the calibration said be less certain, uh, be further inwards. This is the complete vector field learned by the uh, 
spider logistic regression. So this, this is a function that goes from the simplex in 3D, which is a 2D thing, to the simplex in 3D, which is a 2D thing. So you can, so it's like a little bit trickier to visualize, but, um, and you could do this obviously for arbitrary many classes. You just, you just learn a function from uh, the simplex to the simplex. Um, you either using um, the sigmoid or isotonic. If you use isotonic for multi-class classification, it just does an isotonic for each class separately. Okay, this had, took much longer than I thought. Um, all right, maybe some questions you have on calibration before we move on. So this is a little bit of a tricky subject. Um, so you might need to like let it sit for a bit. Um, but I think it's quite important to understand sort of what, what, what's happening here. And maybe th go through the example of uh, thinking about how do I uh, compute this calib calibration curve and what does the um, calibration model actually do? No questions? Okay. Maybe one other thing that's important to note is that if you, let's say you measure your performance by AUC and then you run, um, you build your random forest and then you um, run calibrated classifier SV to get calibration, to get cl uh, calibrated probabilities. What happens to your uh, rock AUC if you run it through calibrated classifier CV? Any ideas? So again, in the, in the binary classification case, what calibrated classifier CV does is basically it learns a 1D function that tries to map the probabilities, like or correct the probabilities to map to the true class frequencies. So what happens to rock AOC if I do that? No. Okay. Then I, so I either explained rock AOC very badly or calibration or both. Um, so this is a monotonous monotonic transformation. If I put something through a sigmoid, the ranking of the points will not change. Rock AOC or average precision both only care about the ranking of the points. So this will not change your rock AOC. This will not change your average precision. The score will be exactly the same because you applied a monotonic transformation. This is not true for multi-class, but for binary, um, this will just not change anything. Uh, this will change the meaning of the probabilities, but these, the, these other two metrics only care about ranking, and so um, they will not change. So if you apply this classifier and you say, oh, why doesn't my uh, rock score become better, is because, well, it, uh, it can't become better. None, basically none of the metrics we usually think about will come, become better with this. It could, this could change the accuracy, but I don't think you should expect this to improve accuracy. Really what this improves is um, the calibration. And most of the metrics we looked at last time do not measure calibration. One metric that I probably should have put on here um, that does measure calibration to some degree is the log loss. So I don't know why anyone would ever use the log loss to measure performance, but in Kaggle competitions, you often see people using the log loss. So the log loss uh, could potentially become better using this. But things like accuracy might not become better and ranking metrics like rock AOC and average precision by definition cannot change. <clears throat> 
I just need to make a, a note to make sure this is on the exam. Okay. Anyway, um, maybe it's going to be on a practice exam that I told you. So um, now for the next half hour or the last half hour, I want to talk a little bit more about how we can change model fitting for um, imbalanced data. And I'm actually going to only talk about some pretty simple methods, um, which are honestly the things that are used in practice. So there's two sources of imbalance that you might consider. One is asymmetric cost, and one is asymmetric data. And I would say by default, you always have both of them. There's no reason why a false positive should be as bad for you as a false negative. They usually correspond to two completely different scenarios in whatever application you have, and you probably want to weight them differently. Also, there's no reason why any data set that you collect should ever be balanced. So you will always have to deal with both of these sources of imbalance usually. Um, so we looked at, I mean, in a sense, uh, one of the simplest ways you can do to change your model is to change the threshold, which is something that we looked at um, last week. And so I can just take the predicted probabilities or the decision function, I can change the threshold, and this will allow me to focus more on one class or on the other class. And so this is a way how I can change how I make decisions based on a model that I built. The things that we're going to talk about uh, today are more like how can I actually change, say, the logistic regression model here directly um, so that it takes uh, maybe the imbalance into account in some way. So I'm going to run again through this mammography data set that we used last week. Um, I want to emphasize, so I'm going to do this as a running example. And what is true on this data set is not necessarily true in general. So it would be interesting to evaluate all of these metrics, all of the methods that I'm going to talk about uh, properly. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not aware of anyone doing actually a proper evaluation of when do these methods help and when do they not help. Um, if anyone wants a research project, this would be a really annoying and really helpful research project. Um, and so, yeah, so this is a very imbalanced data set. We have um, about 11,000 samples in the negative class and 260 samples in the positive class. And so I will use as my metrics um, both the uh, rock AUC and average precision. And there's two models that I'm going to use sort of as my, my baseline models or my running examples, which are logistic regression and random forest. Because these are sort of like gold standard models um, that everybody likes. And so there's a um, couple of things you could do. You could add samples, you can remove samples, and you can change the training procedure. And we will basically, and you can do all of these in like very elaborate ways. It's unclear to me whether any of the elaborate ways are really that useful, but we'll go through some of the basic ways you can do that. We'll start with um, adding and removing samples. One thing that's a little bit annoying about the scikit-learn API is that in scikit-learn pipelines, you can actually not do resampling because of the API of the pipeline. And it's been annoying me for five years, and maybe we'll fix it at some point. The problem is that if you remember this slide from when we talked about pipelines and pre-processing, well, the output of transform is always the data x, but if you go through a pipeline, the y is always stays the same. And because that, that means you can't really change the target in a pipeline, 
which also means you can't subsample the target or you can't add new samples. And so basically, yeah, the scikit-learn pipeline doesn't allow you to do resampling. There's other ways you could implement resampling with scikit-learn, but we haven't decided yet which one is the, is the least bad way. And while we're being indecisive, indecis indecisive in scikit-learn, there's another library that uh, just implements a solution. It's called imbalance learn. Imbalance learn basically extends the scikit-learn API in a way that allows you to do resampling in a pipeline. And so that's what we're gonna use. And so you can just do pip install imbalance learn. Basically what it adds is it adds two methods um, or it adds a new class of objects. Um, and this object, class of objects, your resampler have two methods. Uh, they're a new sample and fit sample. And they also have a pipeline and the pipeline knows about these methods and does the right thing. So sample basically allow, because sample returns both the data and the targets, you could add and remove data points. And in the pipeline, this is only done in fit. Because during fitting, you want to change um, potentially the, the makeup of your data. And in, um, but during prediction, you just want to make predictions for your whole test set. So you don't want to add or remove samples during prediction. So maybe before we go through these methods, taking a step back, um, so the motiva motivation for these is to basically get a better model in some sense. However, there's not really um, any good theory that I think would justify why these techniques should lead to better models. These are mostly heuristics that um, work for some machine learning models. Basically, people observed, well, if I fit my random forest in like the normal way, maybe it only focuses on the one class and it has very bad uh, recall or something like that. And so these are all basically a list of heuristics or hacks that you can use to um, change your model. On this data set, many of the, them don't really work that well. Um, I didn't have the patience to find a data set on which they work well, but it would be good to have examples of both. Or maybe for each of them, see if there exists a data set where they help or not. The simplest is method is random undersampling. By the default in imbalance learn, everything resamples so you have a balanced data set. So before, after train test split, in this data set, we have 8,387 negative samples and 390 positive samples. Oh, sorry, that was wrong. Before, the train data set is 8,387 samples. That's, that's both classes together. Now, what random undersampling does is it undersamples the, minority, the majority class until the classes are balanced. So after, if I do fit sample, the new data set will be only 390 samples. So it will be 195 positive and 195 negative samples. Before that, I had 195 positive samples and 8,100 something negative samples. So you could also change and don't undersample that radically, but by default, it undersamples until the classes are balanced, so there's the same frequency of, for both of these classes. One of the things why this is a um, very like commonly used technique is that we just made our data smaller by a factor of 20, and in some cases, the model will be as good. So we might not like um, expect our model to improve much by throwing away nearly all of the data, but there's many cases where throwing away a lot of the data doesn't impact 
uh, our accuracy. And so, say if you have click prediction and your model and your data is like 100 to 1 imbalanced, you can probably resample it. Maybe not to 1 to 1, but maybe to like 1 to 10 or 1 to 5. So you could throw away a whole lot of data and still get a model that is as good. And the benefit, obviously, is that you have less data to load and to shove around, and your model trains much faster, and your model is smaller. And so random undersampling can be like, very powerful just in making everything faster and smaller. Applying this to our data set here, um, I now I, I use um, the pipeline from Imbalance Learn. So it's called Make Pipeline, also in Imbalance Learn, but I imported it as Make Imp Pipeline. So you remember this is the pipeline not from Scikit-Learn, but from Imbalance Learn. And then I make a pipeline of the random undersampler and logistic regression. So in this case here, you can see the ROC AUC actually goes up a little bit, and the average uh, precision actually goes down by quite a bit. As I think I mentioned last week, so um, I think usually for these very imbalanced data sets, average precision is probably the metric I would look at more, um, but it depends really on your application what the trade-off it is. Do you care about a false positive rate or do you care about precision? And so for the random forest, um, actually, the, um, we see something similar. We see that the uh, rock AUC goes up. So this is actually now the best model. And the average precision drops quite a bit. But again, it's actually quite surprising that this model is still reasonably good. We throw away, we threw away like, uh, 95% of the data, right? We threw away 95% of the data and we still get a reasonable model probably. Um, and this also shows you it's important to look at what, at the different metrics. Uh, because if we looked at just rock AOC, you would get a very different picture than if you wrote, looked just at average precision. And so if we look at rock AOC, this would be a great model. If we look at how impatient are we, this also will be just much, much faster than, um, than training on the full data set. We can also do the, the opposite, basically, and do random oversampling. In random oversampling, we just sample with replacement meaning we sample points from the minority class again and again until we have as many samples as in a majority class. This is, um, so this means obviously points will be replicated multiple times. We only had 192 or whatever points in the positive class, and now afterwards we have 8,192 points. So we basically replicated each point uh, 80 times or something like this. Um, this obviously makes our data set much, much bigger. It's now, our data set is nearly twice as big as it was before. So before the data set was 8,000 samples, now it's, uh, it's 16,000. And again, um, we can uh, look at the, the scores. So here in this case, the AOC went down and the average precision also went down. So in this data set, but it, uh, data set, basically we repeated a bunch of data. So this made training twice as expensive and everything got worse. So maybe this is not a good method on this data set at least. Oh yeah, so I also plotted curves because I like looking at curves. So, um, For the, um, uh, I should have changed the opacity. But you can see that for the um, 
Rock curve and logistic regression, basically, if you're interested in this area, then the original data is good. If you're interested in this area, then maybe the undersampling is good. Whereas if you look at the uh, precision recall curve, in most areas, the original actually fares better. Only like here in the very tail, and maybe in this area, the, the other ones are better. And then we can do the same game for um, random forests. And so we can see actually here for the rock curve, the random forest basically is always better. And for the precision recall curve, um, yeah, the oversample seems to be uh, losing to the original and mostly, and it's mostly the original being best and then here in this tail, maybe the undersampling is the best. So again, it depends like if I care about having a very high recall, then maybe uh, the undersampled model is actually better. But if I care about having a very high precision, then um, the original model is better. There's, so you might have thought just now, well, re replicating all these data points like 20 times seems kind of silly. And um, there's actually a better way to do this. You, there's something in scikit-learn called class weights, which basically changes the math of the algorithms so that it is as if the data points are replicated. And so by default, this also does it in a way that the data set becomes balanced, but you can also reweight it in any way that you want. So by default, it's basically the same effect as oversampling but it's not doing it randomly. So oversampling has a random component because you do um, sampling with replacement. Class weights are just you reweight by the inverse frequencies, basically. And so this is the, in present in basically all models in scikit-learn. I just want to show you like very briefly how this is implemented in linear models and in trees. So. Say you have logis binary logistic regression, it looks like this. And um, if you add class weights, excuse me, then you would weight this, uh, the log loss by some CYI, where YI is the class, the true class of point I. And so each class has a number associated with it, and you weight it by this number. And so as I said, this number is something like the um, in inverse class frequency or number of samples divided by inverse class frequency. And so then this has the same effect as if I would rep replicate the point, each point in class yi c yi times. Uh, the benefit is the data set actually doesn't get bigger. And we can do the same thing for trees. Say we have a Gini index um, as our splitting criteria. So instead of computing the, split, uh, the Gini index like this, I can use uh, for class K, the class Y8 CK, and I just reweight the Gini index for each class by this. And this um, will uh, give me a class weighted version of all the tree based models. And then if I want to make a prediction, we actually use a weighted vote um, of, the, of the samples in each leaf. Yeah, so the way to use class weights is um, you can just set class weight equal to balanced in basically any of the scikit-learn classifiers. Um, and uh, this will mostly not affect the training speed at all, but it will just basically be equivalent to oversampling. This is actually something people relatively frequently do. In this case, because oversampling didn't help, I don't expect this to help, but um, this is probably the first thing I would try uh, because it doesn't change the training speed and, it doesn't, uh, and it's built into scikit-learn. Doing the undersampling is even faster, but then I have to install imbalance learn first. But yeah, so 
but I would basically always do this instead of oversampling because just because it's computationally more efficient. And it's just like a couple of characters. There's um, a variant of this resampling that I want to briefly talk about that um, is called like ensemble resampling or easy ensembles or balanced bagging or has many, uh, data, many names. Um, so there's a couple of uh, papers that I referenced. Uh, I think the main one is the exploratory undersampling for class and balanced learning and using a random forest to learn and balance data. And so the idea is that, okay, undersampling is cool because it allows us to work with much less data. If we build a random forest, we resample the data for each of the trees. But there's, um, so if we do undersampling, we could combine the undersampling with the resampling for the tree. So in essence, what we're doing is for each tree, we build a balanced sample, but uh, it's a different balancing for each tree. So each tree will be built on an undersampled version of the data set, but they will all have different samples from the majority class. And so if you look at the whole ensemble, it will see many different um, negative samples, not only very few, or not negative sam samples from the majority class. And so this is something that I think is um, conceptually very interesting because basically it is as fast as undersampling, but it um, looks at more data. And so yeah, this is particularly, this work, you could do this for any backed model the back model that everybody loves the most is a uh, balanced random forest classifier. You could also do this for gradient boosting if you wanted to, um, but I don't know if anyone has implemented that. I think maybe we're implementing this right now. Um, it's not in scikit-learn, but in imbalanced learn, you can either use the balanced random forest classifier or there's also a balanced bagging classifier. The balanced bagging classifier you can apply to any model. But basically what I'm doing here is I'm using the balanced random forest classifier. Huh. Okay. So when I ran this slide, it was actually it was the best in AUC. It's slightly worse than using the original data, but it's better than using the undersampled data. Today I ran everything again to make new plots, and then actually it was way worse than the other ones. And unfortunately I didn't have time to really investigate it. Um, actually, give me one second. I wanna see if there's just one silly bug. And maybe I can no, it's it's correct. Sample error. Yeah. Hmm. So actually, yeah. So I don't know what happened. So um, I'm surprised that it, right now it's worse than undersampling, and this kind of tells me that something is wrong because it sh shouldn't really be worse than undersampling. Um, so there might also be something about how to train train test split was done or something. But so basically I expect this to be better than just doing undersampling. But um, yeah, for some reason this time it didn't work out. Generally I think this is like a very interesting technique because um, it's very obvious. If you do random forest, it's very obvious to do this. All right, the last, um, technique that I want to talk about is synthetic sample generation. So, so far I only like removed and added samples that already existed. 
There's also a technique called synthetic minority oversampling technique, called, aka SMOT. Some people really like SMOT. Some people really don't like SMOT. Um, the idea is that resampling points and adding the same point again is maybe not the best idea. Um, we should try to add new points that look like the training data set. And so what it does is it adds for each for usually just a minority class or for each class potentially you add synthetic samples by for each sample in the minority class you pick a neighbor random from um, your k neighbors so k is a parameter so let's say you look at the, the three neighbors so I pick one of my three neighbors at random and I pick a point on the line connecting the two um, and um, I add a new point there. So, baby, so you, you're basically looking at the nearest neighbor and you're adding interpolations between all the nearest neighbors or your k nearest neighbors. A variant of this is to actually use uh, not only sample points on the line, but sample points on the rectangle that's spanned by two points. Um, so the paper says do it on the line, but the original implementation does it on the rectangle that's spanned by two points. Um, and I'm not sure if there's a Python implementation for that right now. So maybe this, this example will illustrate it a little bit better. So this is on the, um, mammography data set again. So here on the left is the original data set and here on the right is, uh, using SMOT. So here, uh, Again, by default, it makes it balanced. So we had like 190 data points and we added uh, what's eight, about 8,000 new data points by uh, synthetically. So let's say for this point, we pick one of the three neighbors, which is here's two points here and one point there. And then we pick a point at random from this line. And you can see that basically for this point here, the neighbors were here and we picked points randomly on these lines. And so we added a bunch of new data points that are synthetic in that they don't exist before, but uh, maybe they represent the class distribution. Um, and um, So here again, this uh, I did this relatively naively for both logistic regression and the random forest on this data set. And um, so the, the AUC is about the same, the average precision dropped. Um, I did a search for K neighbors. I didn't, I should have plotted the, uh, uncertainty here, but basically the optimum is at 11. The default was at five. So this was the default setting. And this one on the right is with the grid search setting of 11. But overall, it's still, um, yeah, uh, not doing that great. So here's the comparison that summarizes uh, all the curves. And um, so you can see for the random forest precision recall, actually there's some areas here where SMOT wins. Um, and so, I didn't update this, but yeah. But here there's some uh, areas where SMOT wins, um, but for most of the uh, time, the original data um, actually works best. Um, for the rock curve, also like the undersampling works in a couple of places pretty well, and then SMOTE works in some other places quite well. But if you look at the average precision, the average precision was highest for the original data set. So it again underscores how important it is to look at these curves and look at what is the important, uh, what is the trade-off I wanna make because depending on the trade-off, I might um, pick a different method. So it also kind of shows that um, 
or another takeaway is that undersampling is not way off. So undersampling is still kind of uh, reasonable. And understanding, so here I labeled easy ensembles, but that's the, the balanced bagging. So balanced bagging is as fast as training on the undersample. And so these two are way faster than the rest in imbalanced data sets, and they're still kind of reasonable. So maybe if you're prototyping, you can use either of these approaches, and they will get your results very fast. But overall, it's a bit of a wash, and um, it's a little bit hard to say like, this is the one approach that you should use. These are all, like, feasible approaches, and uh, they make sense in, uh, in some cases. I wouldn't usually do the oversampling. As I said, I would use the class weights, but other than that, this is probably the things I would go through uh, if I try to change my model to account for imbalanced data. And, uh, yeah, that's it for today. <laughs>